and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for October 2022. I'm Hayley and we've got an exciting month ahead as the nights begin to get darker. We've got the Orionid meteor shower, Jupiter's moons putting on a show for us on the 26th and we've got a partial eclipse of the sun. Let's begin by taking a look at the moon. You can see here that I'm on the 4th of October around 11 o'clock and the moon is a waxing gibbous phase and we can take a look at how the moon tracks across the evening sky as we go through the month. Um, so if we go to the 5th, you can see that the moon, as it heads towards full, pays a visit to Saturn. So the 5th is a nice opportunity to see the moon and Saturn together. Then if we keep going to the 8th, you can see that we have the moon and Jupiter on the 8th and the moon by the 8th is very nearly full um, because full moon for October occurs on the 9th. So if you'd like to see the full moon, then if you get out in the evening on the 9th, look towards the southeast and you can see the full moon and also a nice display of Jupiter and Saturn and Mars over here as well. If we keep tracking the moon, as we go past full and get all the way to the 14th into the early hours of the 15th, then you've got the moon um, back down to more or less a half uh, moon close to the planet Mars, which is in the constellation of Taurus. So you can take in um, when you go to observe these, you can take in some of the um, interesting things that you find in the constellation of Taurus as well, such as the Seven Sisters star cluster and Aldebaran, the angry eye of the bull. If we head into the morning of the 25th, that takes us to our partial solar eclipse. So that's a really exciting thing that's happening um, in October. We don't get to see these that often. Um, so your moon watch challenge for this month from me is to see if you can see the moon cross the face of the sun in a partial solar eclipse. The most important thing to note when you're thinking about observing anything to do with the sun is to make sure that you do it safely. Um, so you definitely don't want to look at the sun with your naked eye because you could damage your eyesight. Um, you don't want to be looking at the sun with any equipment that hasn't got a solar filter on it. So if you're going to use a pair of binoculars or a telescope, you need to make sure that it's got a well-fitting solar filter from a reputable supplier. There are a number of ways to observe the eclipse. You don't have to buy an expensive solar filter. Um, you could make yourself a pinhole projector and the way to do that is to um, have a, a light surface or a white piece of paper, um, put that on the ground, get a piece of card, make a pinhole in the card, stand with your back to the sun, hold up the piece of card with the pinhole on it and project an image of the sun onto your uh, light surface or piece of paper. And that's a really, really safe way um, to observe the eclipse. And you should see a, a small image of the sun. And as the eclipse begins to happen, then you'll see that the sun appears to have had a bite taken out of it. Um, there are other projection methods you can try. If you've got a, a tea strainer or a colander in your cupboard at home, you can try the same thing um, using the tea strainer. So um have your light surface to project onto, hold up the tea strainer and you'll get lots of little images of the sun on your uh, piece of paper. And if you look closely, again, you'll be able to see that each of those little suns has got a, a bite taken out of it when the eclipse happens. If you are using a projection method, once you have your image of the sun on your piece of paper, you can move your pinhole camera or your colander or your tea strainer backwards and forwards until you get the best sharpest image that you can on your sheet of paper. And then you can observe the rest of the eclipse. You could sketch it. You could take photos of what appears on the paper, um, however you feel you would most like to spend the time. If you would like to observe the eclipse more directly, you can 
uh, use a solar filter. So you can go to a reputable telescope supplier and you can buy solar filters in a number of ways. So you could buy a pair of eclipse glasses, um, which are a pair of cardboard glasses with solar filter material in them, which enable you to look safely at the eclipse once you have the glasses on. You can buy um, filters that fit over telescopes or binoculars. Again, either made of solar filter material, which is um, like a film, or um, you can get glass filters that fit over telescopes as well, or you can buy a specialist solar telescope. So there are lots and lots of ways that um, you can observe the eclipse safely, depending on um, your budget, how much time you want to spend. Moving on to the eclipse itself, so you can see that I am looking towards the southeast on the morning of the 25th of October around 10 o'clock and the eclipse will start just after 10 o'clock depending on where you are in the country, the time will vary by um, a, a little bit so um, the best thing to do is get out there around 10 and then you can wait for the eclipse to begin or you can look up the exact time for your location. I am viewing from Leicester because Leicester is the home of the National Space Centre and if we just move time on a little bit you can see that first contact when the moon first appears to start taking a bite out of the sun occurs at around eight minutes past ten in Leicester. If you are in the northeast, so northeast Scotland, you will get the biggest view of the eclipse. The, the magnitude of the eclipse will be about 35%. And a magnitude gives us an idea of how much of the sun's surface is going to be covered. Um, if you are down in the southwest of England, the magnitude will be about 17%. The length of time that the eclipse takes, again, depends where you are in the country. Um, it will last one to two hours. The longest will be if you're up in the northeast and the shortest will be if you are down in the southwest. And let's just see how the eclipse progresses here in Leicester. And you can see that it's not a huge eclipse. There isn't a huge amount of the sun's surface covered, but it is significant. If you are observing, you should definitely be able to tell that the sun has had a bite taken out of it. And you can see here that the final contact is at around 11.49. And then the moon moves away. So fingers crossed for good weather on the morning of the 10th. The sun is my favourite thing to observe, I think. And um, I do a lot of photography of the sun. So I'm really hoping for a nice clear day so that we can take some good photographs of the eclipse. If we move back into the nighttime sky now, and I'm just going to go forward by just one day to the 26th. And I have a planet watch challenge for you for the 26th and for this challenge to do it in full you'll need a small telescope something um, with a um, aperture front diameter of really three inches or above would be good so 75 mil or more um, you could probably get away with something a little bit smaller than that um, so I'm going to go to around six o'clock in the evening so just after sunset and our target is Jupiter and let's zoom in on Jupiter. If you don't have a small telescope, you can still observe Jupiter. You can um, view it looking like a, a really bright, it almost looks like a really bright star. We know it's not a star, it's a planet, but it will be the brightest thing in this region of sky. And after the sun sets, it will be the first thing to pop out as well. Um, and if you have a pair of binoculars, you can have a go at spotting these four Galilean moons and the moons are the target of my challenge for you because they will be doing a bit of a dance on the evening of the 26th um, starting with Ganymede so I'm just going to zoom in nicely so if you do have a small telescope um, get it trained on Jupiter um, just after six o'clock and you'll see that the moon Ganymede begins to transit the surface of Jupiter at around 6.15 and you can try to follow it as it does that and viewing transiting moons against the bright surface of Jupiter is actually quite tricky um, because um, 
they can appear to sort of blend in. So it's interesting to see how long you can follow it for before you lose it. Um, the brighter ones, um, especially Europa, are harder. You will lose those more quickly um, than the darker ones. So it's a good challenge to see whether you can follow them or not. Um, so Ganymede at 6.15, uh, if you keep following Ganymede across the surface for an hour or so, then at 7.25... Europa starts to do the same thing around 7.25. So we've now got uh, both Ganymede and Europa um, transiting the um, surface of Jupiter. Um, Ganymede being Jupiter's largest moon, which um, is actually larger than the planet Mercury. Europa being um, a very icy moon. It's got uh, an ocean under its icy surface and it's thought to be a candidate in the solar system where there might be microbial life. So um, Europa is a really interesting moon to think about and observe and study. Um, if we keep watching, then at three, around three minutes past eight, the moon Io, which is a volcanic moon, the most volcanic body in the solar system, gets occulted by Jupiter, meaning that it passes behind the planet. So we can see that begin to disappear. So we've now got Ganymede and Europa in transit. We've got Io's been occulted. Um, if we keep viewing, then at around 8.53, we see Io's shadow begin to transit the surface of Jupiter. And there it is. Um, Shadow transits are easier to see than transits of the moons themselves. So if you've been struggling to follow these two, then you might have an easier time looking at Io's shadow. And then finally, at around 18 minutes past nine, Ganymede's shadow begins to transit as well. So there are five events to see um, involving Jupiter interacting with its moons on the 26th. So starting with Ganymede beginning to transit, then Europa, then Io gets occulted, then Io's shadow appears, and then Ganymede's shadow appears. So if you have a small telescope available to you, see how much of that you can observe. And you again, as we were talking about with the eclipse, if you want to, you can sketch what's going on over time. I want to move on and think about our constellation of the month now, which is Orion. Um, so one of the most famous constellations in the night sky, um, one of the easiest to pick out and one of my favourites um, because there's just so much to see um, in the constellation of Orion. So I'm just going to go late into the night, into the early hours of the morning when it's a little bit higher. And I'm going to take us um, back to the 21st of October. Um, and that is because the Orionid meteor shower peaks on the 21st of October. So it's a really good um, meteor shower to observe. The moon will be out of the way for most of the time, um, which is good. Let's put meteor showers on so you can see the radiant of the meteor shower which is where the meteors appear to originate from is up here and the you can see Orion in meteors um, throughout October but the best time to observe them is um, close to the peak and the peak of the meteor shower occurs around 7 p.m on the 21st um, you'll need to wait for Orion to get a little bit higher so the um, evening of the 21st, the early hours of the morning of the 22nd are going to be your best time to observe. As with all meteor showers, the best advice is to go to a location that is as dark as possible. If you can't get to a dark location, don't worry, you'll still be able to see meteors, you just might not be able to see quite so many. Wrap up nice and warm. It's amazing how cold you can get when you're standing still in one position or lying down in one position for quite a while. And observe for as long as you can, a couple of hours. Um, I quite like doing it from a sun lounger because I can lie down, I can look up, I can get a blanket to keep me warm, hot chocolate, etc. Um, and see how many meters you can spot. It's really good to let your eyes adapt to the dark for about 20 minutes and then not look at any sources of light that might ruin your dark adaptation after that so try not to be looking at your phone or a screen or a light in the house um, because you won't see as much if your eyes are not very well adapted and you can look anywhere in the sky so 
you don't even have to find the constellation because the meteors will appear all over. Um, looking up at an altitude of around 60 degrees is good, but again, you can look at any altitude. Um, if you observe meteors that appear close to the radiant, then they will appear to have shorter trails. The ones that are further away will appear to have longer trails. Um, the amount of meteors that you might see, that can uh, vary quite a lot. Um, it's, it's hard to predict. The predicted uh, peak hourly rate for this meteor shower is 20 per hour. But what we have to remember about these um, peak rates uh, is that they are idealised. So they assume the conditions are perfect. They assume the radiant is directly above your head. So in practice, you will see less than that. Um, but you, if you go out for a couple of hours, you should definitely see some meteors as long as the weather is cooperating. Let's take a closer look at Orion now. So you can see that if we put the art on, Orion is depicted as a hunter and is facing off against Taurus the bull. And you can see the angry eye of the bull staring at Orion and Orion staring back. There's lots of interesting things to see within Orion. Um, you can have a look at two of the brightest stars in the night sky that appear in Orion, which are Betelgeuse and Rigel. Um, Betelgeuse being a red supergiant and Rigel being a blue supergiant. So an interesting thing to do when you are looking at this constellation is to see if you can see the difference in colour. Um, Betelgeuse appearing a orangey red colour, Rigel appearing a bluey white colour. A deep sky challenge for you for this month is to see if you can spot the Orion Nebula. Um, the Orion Nebula is a star forming region in Orion and it's a really good nebula to observe if you are still a beginner and you haven't observed very many deep sky objects before because it's one of the brighter ones. It's fairly easy to find because it's within this very distinctive constellation um, and you can spot it with your naked eye. Um, and the way to spot it is to look for the Orion's belt asterism, which appears here. Look for Orion's sword, which is hanging down from the belt. And one of the stars within the sword with your naked eye will appear to be a bit fuzzy or a bit blurry. And if you can spot that, what you've actually found is not a star, but the, the nebula um, where stars are being formed. If you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope then you'll be able to see the nebula in a little bit more detail it will look like a fuzzy patch or fuzzy cloud you might be able to see a collection of four stars within the nebula in the shape of a trapezium as well i'm going to finish by taking a look at the international space station as always, if you want to know when the International Space Station is going to pass above your location, then you can use the Spot the Station website. Um, one good time to spot the ISS is on the morning of the 27th of October. Um, so there's some good morning passes this month if you're an early riser. Um, starting at about 6.21. Um, so the sky is still relatively dark um, and this should be a, a fairly bright pass that reaches a fairly good altitude so let's just move time on there it goes um, so if you can get out just before 6 21 on the morning of the 27th if the sky is clear then um, you have a good chance of seeing the iss pass over that brings me to the end of our tour of the night sky for October. I wish you clear skies, especially if you are planning to observe that eclipse. Fingers crossed for um, a cloudless sky on the 25th.